You know what's harder to find than a needle in a haystack? A hospital CEO actively participating in social media. In just a moment, we have a conversation with Paul Levy about why the C-suite is a little hesitant to participate in social media on Get Social Health. Welcome to Get Social Health, a conversation about social media and how it's being used to help hospitals, social practices, healthcare practitioners, and patients connect and engage via social media. Get Social Health brings you conversations with professionals actively working in the field and provides real life examples of healthcare social media in action. Here is your host, Janet Kennedy. You've heard me say, that I think CEOs in healthcare tend to be very disengaged from social media. And I wondered, why is that? So I went out and found one. Paul Levy is a CEO in healthcare, in public utilities, in regional water and wastewater systems. He's been there and done that. But above all, he considers himself a coach. Welcome to Get Social Health, Paul. Thank you, Janet. It's great to be with you. So let me set the stage to our conversation. As I mentioned in my intro, I think that the C-suite tends to be a little disengaged from social media, particularly in healthcare. However, you've been an executive in a number of different industries from um, energy to healthcare and on. So can you share a little bit of a perspective about the C-suite in general and how they tie into to marketing and to this new emerging technology, social media? Sure. So let's think about what, what's one of the most important jobs for the chief executive or other high official in a company or in an institution. It's to represent to the outside world what that organization stands for how it's going to best serve its customers and the like. And their other job is to represent to the inside, to their own staff, the very same thing in terms of priorities, ethics, um, purpose, and the like. So the question I've always had when I, when I, uh, when I look at what, what you've raised as far as the reluctance of C-suite people to use social media is you don't use a telephone. You don't use interviews with newspapers. You don't use speeches. Well, of course you do. You use all those things. So why wouldn't you use social media, another set of tools? Well, okay, let's go back historically then, and I'm not implying in any way that you're old. So, But thinking about a C-suite from the way back, when broadcast media came about, I imagine that there were a number of chief executives that said, I'm not going on TV, I'm not doing interviews. And certainly 60 Minutes pointed out that maybe this is something that you should consider very carefully. And because news was at 5, 11, you know, a very scheduled sort of thing, you had time to go to your PR and your crisis communications people and work through what you were going to say. That's not available at all. It's 24-7 news, and and social media is almost an instantaneous response. Do you think that's part of the reluctance? Well, I, I guess it's part of the reason you need to do it, too. By the way, remember the old line, you know you're going to have a bad day when Mike Wallace rings your front doorbell from 60 Minutes? Um, I was going to say that, but uh, I thought I would, you know, <laughs> the younger members wouldn't know what I was talking about it myself. <laughs> so, so here's the deal. Um, uh, usually, the traditional media, which is to say um, newspaper reporters and editors who arrange for an interview with a chief executive, how does that work? That, well, they do their interview, they write their story, they edit it, they decide on the timing, they decide on the emphasis of the story, and then it gets published, either in print or on television or on the radio. At that point, you as the chief executive are are powerless to do anything in terms of how that story is going to be presented. In contrast with social media, blogs, Twitter, and the like, you actually decide on the timing, the scope, and the emphasis. There's no one editing what you're saying. It's a very, very powerful form of communication to your external and internal audiences. You raise an excellent point, because when you think about, you might 
have an interview with a, a news organization and you might talk to them for an hour or more. Heck, you might even talk to them all day. And how many of your specific words actually get into the final product? You know, 30, 50, 100. Um, so you're right from the standpoint of going direct to the end user, the person you want to get your story. Social media is much more expedient and much more focused on what you want to say. It's also less risky. Now, a lot of people have trouble with that concept. They say, oh, my gosh, what if I say something on Twitter or Facebook or my blog that, that's wrong? Um, you know, I'm going to get into all kinds of trouble. Well, compare that to being misquoted by a reporter in a news story. So your name and your misquote is on page one on Tuesday. You, you call up the publisher and you say, you made a mistake. Oh, we'll do a correction, and it shows up on page 93 on Friday, and nobody ever sees the correction. If I make a mistake on my blog, you, I, I can guarantee you that within seconds, I will learn about that mistake by comments that I've received, and then I can go in and I can correct it well before the, the, the news cycle has even started. Well, that's the other thing that's really interesting about social media is – it is a two-way conversation, um, or it should be. So the few CEOs that I do see in social tend to be broadcasting. They're treating it as their, their mouthpiece or their funnel up for information they want to send out. They're not necessarily engaging back. Well, I, I, I think the power of it is you hear from people you otherwise might not hear from. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people saying, well, I don't want to do a blog or whatever because people will say nasty things about me or my company. Well, rest assured, they're saying those things anyway. But now at least you get to hear them and perhaps even rebut them. Well, and or take action to fix them. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so that's an interesting question about um, who should be engaging. So in a, you've worked for some very large organizations with a quite an extensive hierarchy of people. Obviously, the CEO sits in a quite a singular position, but there could be any number of people who are tweeting, whether it's on behalf of the company or they just have the company profile um, or where they work in their profile. Do you ever feel the need to caution or train any of the folks underneath you about how they engage on behalf of the co company? Or is it really presumed that you're a professional behave professionally? Well, do I tell them how to talk on the telephone? It's the same thing. Now, of course, you're broadcasting to a larger group. You have to trust that the people who work in the organization are sensible and thoughtful and are not trying to do something harmful or stupid uh, in social media. Of course, they might make a mistake. Of course, you might make a mistake. But that's that's just life in general. So, no, I, um, I, I think the, the important thing is that people talk in their own voice, whether they're blogging or tweeting or whatever. The social media world is really very astute at picking up PR-like um, um, expositions of issues, and they don't read that. They just It's not interesting. They want to know about you personally and how you personally think about something and how you feel about it. So it's got to be in your own voice. What's well, interesting you mentioned that I went back and looked at a number of the CEOs that I follow, and I did find a, a little, uh, not disturbing because this isn't scientific at all, but it was, I don't know, an, an unfortunate opportunity that many of them were just retweeting, you know, flack stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. were retweeting their company line or, you know, something that came from maybe an industry, which is all well and good that they're sharing information. But I had to really look to go, well, yeah, well, what do you think? Right. And, and in my case, and maybe I was a little extreme on this, but I'm not sure I was, my press people and my legal staff wouldn't know what I was going to be saying on my blog or on Twitter or whatever until they read it. There was no review, no pre-review by them and no editing by them. It was in my voice. Did you, did you publish regularly on your blog? Yes. I, I, when I was running the hospital, uh, it would be several times a week. Uh, frankly, to generate any meaningful traffic, you have to publish a lo uh, often um, uh, for a lot of reasons. One reason is if you only write once a week or once every two weeks, people will kind of forget about you. Um, for another thing, the, uh, 
the Google um, bot that that um, that works for their search engine uh, actually surveys all the blogs in the world on a regular basis, and the ones that have the most changes in them get higher rankings in the in the search algorithm. So if you're trying to generate traffic, and after all, if you're going to do this, one of your purposes is to generate traffic so people actually pay attention and and choose to read you. Um, you want to you want to have new material quite often. Well, let's talk specifically about your blog, which is uh, personal observations. But I, I only read the most recent uh, articles. So can you go back to the beginning and tell me when did you start blogging and what was the purpose of your being there? Uh, it was August 2006. I happened to read an article in the New York Times business section about how few CEOs at the time had blogs. Uh, and corporate CEOs, and and I said, oh, you know, I'm one of those, and I have a really interesting job, and people are interested in healthcare. Why don't I start writing about uh, things I see in the hospital world and uh, in the healthcare world? So I started August uh, 2006. Um, uh, I, I wrote a few posts. Uh, I went to Google to search my, you know, how I was showing up on the Google search. And I didn't show up at all. And I said, gee, what's going on here? And then I realized no one was reading it. So the algorithm at Google, didn't, didn't, as far as they were concerned, I didn't exist. So then the issue was, well, how do you generate some traffic? So I sent an email to my 500 closest friends saying, hey, I'm writing this blog. Please check in. Please tell your friends. And then I started to show up on Google. And then a reporter at the Boston Globe um, wrote a story about the fact that I was writing the blog, and, and from then it was off to the races. Um, so that's how it all got started. And what kind of topics did you talk about in your blog? Uh, at the beginning, I talked about mainly things having to do with my hospital, um, issues we were facing, successes we were having, problems we were having. But even then, I, I talked about some public policy issues that, affected health care as well, um, how insurance rates were set, um, relationships with unions, um, um, federal policies, stuff like that. Um, I tried to make it as much as possible a kind of magazine with different features about different topics in the hope that it would be interesting to most people most of the time. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read a quote I pulled from the comments section of one of your more recent posts. And this person said that um, over these years through this blog, you've inspired, challenged, provoked, yeah, right, and informed in a setting and anchored in transparency, which triggered much sharing and learning. And then uh, I, I excerpt a little bit. Via this early and innovative vehicle, when many were asking what's a blog, your drive to eliminate harm and continuously improve quality was relentless. So I now am picturing your PR and communications people waking up on whatever Tuesday and Friday morning going, oh, God, he's posting today. I wonder what he's saying. <laughs> well, they did, actually. And what was really interesting is sometimes my PR person would get a call from a reporter. What did Paul mean by what he said on the blog today? And she would say, what did he say? I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> so those were some great moments. And there were also moments where I would inadvertently scoop a reporter. So let's say a reporter was working with our press department on a particular story, and I didn't know about it, and I would write about it. And then they'd call our press agent saying, why did you let him write about this? I've been working on this story for three weeks. Um, so sometimes I didn't know about that, too. Um, but the, this whole, uh, that was a really lovely comment that that person posted. Um, my blog evolved over time from just kind of an interesting magazine about what's going on in healthcare to a very, very strong focus on how to improve the quality and safety of patient care, not only in our place, but beyond. And that's an important issue because hundreds of thousands of people are are harmed, are killed and hurt in hospitals every year in the, in the U.S. and around the world. And we were working hard on trying to eliminate preventable harm. And I decided that we, sh that I should post on the blog how we were doing. So I was actually posting our infection rates and things like that, uh, along with the work we were doing 
um, in, in, a, in an aim to try to be helpful to other people around the world. Seems to me you would be getting a lot of pushback from the uh, medical director or the medical staff on posting that kind of information. Well, our, our chief of medicine, who was our biggest proponent for quality and safety improvement, was thrilled when I started to do that. In fact, he called me. The, I didn't ask his permission. I just started posting these infection rates. And he called me the next day. He says, this is perfect. This is just what we need. This will help us do even better. Oh, well, kudos and congratulations to, to you and your team for taking that attitude because so many – uh, I think in the C-suite are more of a, um, a fortress kind of mentality of let's keep this all inside the gate uh, and to be so transparent, particularly in healthcare before people were calling for it uh, as much is just really an important example to set. Well, it's interesting because back in in that period in, in, in uh, 2006, 7 and 8, as you suggest, there were not many people who were being transparent about clinical outcomes for fear of being criticized or sued or whatever it was. And we decided on a different approach, that the only way to improve as a hospital was to admit where we weren't doing well and to work together to do better. Seems pretty straightforward, uh, but it's not a common view in the medical world. It is more common now, and I I do think, immodestly, that this blog had something to do with that. Um, I remember hospitals uh, around the country calling later saying, did you get into trouble for doing this? What happened? And I would explain we didn't get into trouble, and in fact that it improved things, and some of them started doing similar things. I'm envisioning, though, the insurance company, whether you were self-insured or had external assurance, maybe having a heart attack about this. No, actually, they were very pleased. We, uh, our insurance company uh, it, uh, was Crico, which is a captive insurance company of the Harvard hospitals, all the Harvard hospitals. And it was totally consistent with their underlying philosophy of clinical process improvement and, in fact, avoiding malpractice lawsuits. Uh, because remember, the data that I was showing would have been discoverable in any malpractice lawsuit anyway. It's not like you're going to keep it away from a plaintiff who is aggrieved, who feels they've been harmed in your hospital. Uh, but by publishing it in advance, it acted as an impetus for our people to try harder to do better. And um, so our insurance companies, uh, our insurance company was was quite content with it. And in fact, our malpractice rate went down. Well, if that isn't uh, true and dear to a CEO's heart, I don't know what is. <laughs> it's always nicer not to be sued than to be sued. Um, but but let, let's think about it more broadly. I mean, every hospital in the world has a wonderful mission and a wonderful purpose to alleviate human suffering caused by disease. People choose to be doctors and nurses and the other healthcare professionals because they're extremely well-intentioned. No one goes to work every day saying, what can I do to harm a patient? Quite the opposite. And yet a lot of harm occurs in hospitals. So social media can be a helpful tool in providing people with a little bit more encouragement and impetus for doing better. And um, and uh, if you do it respectfully, um, in a manner that respects the prerogatives of the staff, that recognizes that they are well-intentioned, um, talks about their successes and some of their failures, but in a positive way, uh, you can make a lot of progress. Let me ask you a couple questions about uh, other forms of social media. Um, when I talk with uh, organizations or even individuals about being active in social, a blog is usually the first thing. That's the hub of your communications. That's where your where your unedited thoughts are, where your uh, philosophies and where the things you believe uh, you can write about. But there are so many other avenues to take that information externally. So what other social media platforms are you engaged in? And I understand you have an interesting Twitter story, which is what I'm leading up yeah, to. Yeah, well, first I, I jumped over to Facebook, which at the time was just, a, this is ancient history now, was just opening up to non-students. Remember the days that Facebook was only available for college students? Anyway, it had just opened up, and a, a friend of mine, um, uh, who another CEO who was blogging, said, you should join Facebook. And I said, why? 
He said, well, it's fun. So, so I joined Facebook, and it was then that I discovered that people in their 20s who worked in my hospital didn't use email, but they did use Facebook. So pretty soon I had over a 1,000 people working in the hospital as friends on Facebook, and we would trade stories and information and the like. And then someone uh, said, you should try Twitter. And, and I said to the same person, well, why? And he said, well, just try it. And I tried Twitter. At first, I thought it was stupid. I mean, what could you say in 140 characters? Well, it turns out you can say quite a lot, and you can lead people to your blog, and you can lead people to other stories. And it became addictive. So I wrote back to this so-called friend, and I said, thanks a lot. And he said, yes, Facebook is the gateway drug that leads to the crack that is uh, Twitter. And um, and it, it is pretty addictive. Um, and what I, I, so I would use Twitter outgoing in, in terms of sending out messages, but I also use it as kind of I use it as my librarian. I follow people who read interesting stuff and they post that stuff on Twitter and it really helps me keep up to date on the industry. Absolutely. Now, have you ever participated in tweet chats? Yeah, once or twice. I'm, I, you know, to me, the the main advantage of social media, which people forget is that you can play with it asynchronously, which is to say, when you're writing something, your readers don't have to be reading it at that moment and don't have to be responding at that moment. They live according to their own life schedule, and you live according to yours. When you get involved in a tweet chat, it's kind of a formalization of this back and forth within a prescribed time period. And... To me, it kind of violates the whole the whole benefit of social media, which is it doesn't have to be synchronous. It can be asynchronous. Although I will point out that uh, from my perspective, Twitter and social media has been amazing to connect me with people throughout the world, really, in specific fields. However, occasionally you want to make sure that you're actually having a conversation as opposed to just passing back and forth messages. So I have found it to be really interesting to be same time, especially when somebody's in the Philippines or Australia. That's a little hard to manage. But, you know, I found that that's a real advantage to social media. Well, the other the other way I've used it that way in Twitter, uh, use Twitter that way is during conferences. So I might be at a conference listening to a really interesting speaker and I'll be tweeting the highlights of that talk in real time as it's going on, and then people around the world will be responding in real time as well, and it's it's like adding an extra audience to the conference, the people who couldn't get there. Absolutely, and, and I think that's probably my favorite way to use Twitter is to do live social media. Although I will tell you it's a little bit um, disconcerting when you are the speaker, and and all of a sudden you realize people in the audience are writing down everything you say and people are responding around the world. And the most disconcerting is when they show that tweet board up on a screen behind you as you're giving your speech. That's really uh, it's multidimensional and very disconcerting. Well, I would be extremely distracted and going, what are they saying about me? Wait, I'm talking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in fact, at one point I was giving, I was up in a, at a conference in Saskatoon and there was a, there was a fellow doing a lead in before and, and he was gesticulating w- with his arms quite a lot. And to me, he looked like a flight attendant doing the, 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 uh, the safety briefing. At, at the beginning, and so I actually did a tweet saying, so-and-so looks like a flight attendant, and it showed up on the board next to him, and everybody in the audience started laughing, and he said, what's going on here? <laughs> so it was a funny moment. All right, he was heckled by his own speaker. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and honestly, that's, I think, one of the challenges of social media that probably scares the C-suite is it's very hard to tell tone. So those of us who are snarky or sarcastic or a smarty pants, um, you know, people who know us get when we're making jokes. Otherwise, it could fall flat. Well, and you have to use those little emoticons. They're, they're really as stupid as they are in one way. They're very helpful to make it clear to someone that I'm making a joke now. I'm not serious about what I just said. 
Oh, you know, that's a good point. I, I will definitely do the happy face, smiley face. I'm not up to putting in little images yet. I haven't. I haven't. I don't, I don't do the images either, but beyond the smiling face, you can do all kinds of faces, like sticking a tongue out and stuff like that. Oh, you are talented. Oh, I tell oh. you, multi-talent. But, well, now, of course, all the keyboards have those emoticons pre-programmed, so you just click on the one you like. They can, you can also have a little devil smile. <laughs> okay, that, that will be my new favorite emoticon. Well, let me ask you about uh, your evangelism for social media, and maybe you don't, but um, you got led into it down, down the garden path uh, to join social media. Have you ever then gone to your peers and said, you know what, you really need to be doing this? No, I don't, because uh, <clears throat> you have to decide to do it on your own. But I have advised a lot of people who've done it. Um, in terms of how to get started, how to build audience, how to how to make it interesting, um, and stuff like that, and I think I've been helpful to some of my colleagues who've done it. Um, there's still remarkably few hospital CEOs who have blogs. I kind of I try to keep track of them, and I I put them on my blog roll to lead people to them. I think there are fewer than ten uh, worldwide that I know about who are doing it still. And when you consider there are 4,000 hospitals in the United States alone, that's a pretty small percentage. Well, then there's a real opportunity for someone to become a thought leader in a much broader way by publishing. There's an opportunity, but it takes work. It takes commitment. You also have to you have to be a bit narcissistic here. You have to think that that what you have to say might be interesting to other people because you're not just writing for for academic reasons, you, you know, you're actually writing to get a story out or a message out or a purpose out. And so you have to believe that what you have to say might be interesting to other people. And then you actually have to make it interesting. Um, so it, it takes some thought. It does not take a lot of time, however, depending how fast you are at writing. It, I, I, I used to spend uh, 15 minutes a day writing. Um, and uh, that wasn't a big commitment. Well, and it does depend, I think, on the habit of it. If you don't write very often, you probably are just stumbling over, I have to pontificate, I have to say something really important. But if you're writing two or three times a week, you can be more in the moment and say, here are my thoughts today. Well, not only that, but you, you start to accumulate ideas because you know you're going to be writing something in a day or two. So, so I never, ever ran out of ideas. I always had a, a file folder full of my own ideas are things that people had sent to me. Um, so, yes, practice makes perfect, and uh, and you just you, you go at it, you do it. If you budget a, a certain time of the day every day to do it, you're more likely to do it. And then, and then the other thing is you never, ever write when you're tired or angry. Um, and if you do, or if you do, you write it, and then you immediately delete the whole thing. <laughs> Well, it's very cathartic, right? It is. It is. But the catharsis comes in the writing, not in the publishing. Oh, I imagine so. So uh, you have to have published some things, though, that, that rankled a few people. So do you look at your analytics and see, oh, people really like when I write about this, I'm going to write more of that? Well, I looked at the analytics all the time, uh, but I, I tended not to use them to influence the topics. The topics were the ones that were interesting and timely to me, um, that I thought might be interesting and timely to other people. If you look at historical patterns of what's interesting to people, they're not necessarily dispositive of what's going to be interesting next week. Um, so you just have to take a chance and go with what you think works. And, and how about the... Uh the, the troll aspect, the negative comments, did you have to deal with that very often? Well, you set up your blog... This is what you could do on a blog that you can't do on Twitter. Um, you, you set up your um, blog so that the comments are moderated by you before they show up for the world to see. Uh, on Twitter, you can't do that. Once you tweet something, the world has it and it's out of your control. But on a blog, you can keep, uh, you can keep really nasty stuff from being published. I did not block criticism of my blog posts. In fact, that that's what made things more interesting. But I did block ad hominem attacks. I did block commercial messages, uh, profanity, stuff like that. So what about offering some words of wisdom 
Uh, so you're not going to evangelize and tell somebody they have to do it. But when they're ready, they're in the right mindset I want to get more active in social. Would you say that a blog is the essential place to start? Or do you think that they could just jump into Twitter and it'd be more or less time consuming? Well, I think uh, neither nor, I mean, or both. Um, anybody can jump into Twitter right away and just start commenting on things other people have written. Uh, you can only do it in 140 characters, but it's 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 good practice and and kind of gets your name out there. Um, I think um, I, I think a blog is useful as a place to start because you can get practice uh, on setting forth your views and practice writing. You can start at your own pace. Um, but the thing I would say to people, and I have said to people, is make sure it's in your voice. Um, it has to it has to feel personal, or other people will have no interest in reading it. Very good. Very good. Oh, are you keeping up with your blog? Yeah, well, I've been writing daily for for years, and uh, in the last few weeks, I've decided I'm going to change the focus a bit of my blog. For years, it was healthcare only, for the most part, um, and about. Um, market issues, public policy, all those kinds of things since I, since I left the hospital. Um, now I've shifted the focus and I'm talking mainly about leadership issues, um, negotiation, process improvement, things like that, more general uh, topics, not only for the healthcare world, but for other fields as well. Well, that sounds even more challenging. That's a, that's a very broad topic, but it also sounds like from the reading the comments on the blog, people are very much feeling a need for that sort of content. Well, we'll see. And the trick for me will be to see if I can make it interesting because there are a lot of people who've written a lot about leadership issues and negotiation and, and the like. And, you know, after a while, it all starts to sound the same. And so the the challenge for me is well how do, how do I make this still feel personal um, and uh, engaging for folks and relevant in their lives? We'll see how that goes. All right. Well, I wish you the best of luck and thank you very much for being with me on Get Social Health. It's been a pleasure. Listen up! It's time for a social media success tip. Hey, Dr. Mike Savilla here. You know, a question that I get a lot is, you know, do I need a personal website for me? And I definitely recommend, yes, you need that home base where you can direct people. Uh, and, you know, at that uh, website, you can have all of your uh, social media platforms there. You can have your, you know, Twitter ID and Google Plus and LinkedIn and all that stuff. So I definitely recommend that you look into getting your own uh, website. It does, it could be free, you know, it could be something on Blogger or WordPress, or there's also, you know, fee based. Uh, websites as well, but you definitely need to put your stamp on the internet. It'll be great for your own personal uh, online reputation. So think about getting that personal website for you. You've been listening to the Get Social Health podcast. The show notes are located at getsocialhealth.com. To join our healthcare social media journey, follow at Get Social Health on Twitter and start a conversation. Thank you for joining me for Get Social Health. I'm very happy that you're a listener. And if you have a moment to go to iTunes and write a review or give me a rating, I would really appreciate it. If you're just entering social media, or maybe you think you might need a little help, please stop by GetSocialHealth.com and click on Online Courses. And you'll find our first course, LinkedIn for Healthcare Professionals, available right now. Check out this course and the others that are coming up from Get Social Health.